Hi, I'm North Star member Karen Green, and today I'm talking with North Star member Lynette Anniker. Hi, Lynette. Hi. What brings you to North Star? Well, I wanted to look for a community that wasn't based in my illness. And how does that manifest for you here? Well, people are more optimistic as far as doing jobs relating towards non-medical diagnoses and all around a better community full of people. What do you bring to the mix here? I'm a peer support specialist, which entails talking out issues with other members and other people with mental illness and giving them a better perspective as far as what could be helpful or not so much and giving them hope. What's your diagnosis? I have schizophrenia. I've had it since I was 17. I went in the army. They gave me a drug called ionizod or INH for tuberculosis. Caused me to get schizophrenia. I was not diagnosed until 2002 and I was in the army in 1997. So five years later. And even then I didn't take my medication because they never told me what my true diagnosis was. But in 2004, I finally had a final break and landed in the hospital several times. And then after that, I started taking my medication because they threatened the state hospital after me. Now, schizophrenia is defined as a serious mental illness per federal law. And it's not a diagnosis that's very well understood. What is the experience of being schizophrenic? I hear a lot of noises and voices and I get very paranoid. So when I'm driving down the road, I feel like people are following me, which they are, (laughs) but not in the sense of there's a car behind me, I should pay attention, more a sense of they're out to get me, why are they behind me, what are they doing, why are they looking at me, why are they moving to the left or right. It becomes very distracting and then my voices, they kind of interrupt with that too so they'll be making comments about my paranoia and making even worse also the noises and signals I hear are on a constant basis so I could be sitting in a lawn chair relaxing and they will be there no matter what I do so it's very frustrating because people don't hear what I hear. So I'm always looking over my shoulder and people are always going, oh, she's kind of weird. She's like always checking behind her. Also, I have lethargy, which means basically that I have no motivation to do anything. So cleaning and cooking and doing the basic skills you need to survive is very difficult for me. I have to fight every moment just to get something done. I also have akathisia and dystonia, which akathisia is the restless movement. So I get very restless and I'll start pacing or I'll start wiggling my legs or my hands. And then the dystonia is actually twitching in my face that I have no control over. So I can feel it. It's not very noticeable for most people. Like, they can't notice I'm doing it, but I can feel it, so I feel like everybody's staring at me, so it does not help the paranoia whatsoever. How do you manage these symptoms? I love cognitive behavioral therapy for schizophrenia. I took that for about five months, and it gave me a new perspective on what was really real and what wasn't. So I question everything. I also have delusional beliefs as well, so that doesn't help. So let's say I have a delusional belief. I once thought I had a microchip in my head that was controlling me. I did some research per the cognitive behavioral therapy and realized we don't have the technology for that yet. So how could I possibly have a microchip that was put in 2007 when that technology was nowhere near being close? Although I have to admit the technology is getting closer so it makes me a bit scared just because I won't be able to disprove it. Do you do a lot of research when you are experiencing delusions? Uh, Yeah, I use educational-based theories to try and educate myself as far as what is real and what is it. I also ask my fellow person if they see or hear the same thing I am. Or if I see that no one else is looking around the room, I realize there's nothing there.
It sounds like it can be quite isolating. Yeah, I used to isolate a lot. I was pretty messed up from 2004 to 2009. I had no structure. I was on a, a, a sort of community treatment team. I sat at home, smoked cigarettes, and drank coffee. That was my life. And then I moved out here to Portland in 2009 and found NAMI first and they got me and a better doctor in Sequoia Mental Health. They got me the help I needed and treated me like an adult and then I found North Star and it gave me even more purpose and perspective. You mentioned using a number of educational practices in your life. What kinds of techniques do you use that are informed by academic knowledge of education? So educational practices that I use are theories and hypothesis just a lot of research. So if I want to work on a car, I get a book. If I want to do math, I get a book. Instead of math or a car, I got books on schizophrenia. And I read just as much as I could possibly read without stopping. (laughs) And I also read about the medication and what you can take and the metabolite and the dosages and the starting and the tapering and the withdrawal. So I learned all that through my journey because I did not want to be taking something blindly and then wondering why I was either so sick or getting hurt by it. What did your life look like when you were at your lowest? I was on the verge of going to the state hospital for a very long time. And I had no structure, no ability to tell what reality was, no ability for having empowerment over my actions or the ability to decide for myself. I was no longer an adult. I was a little kid that would never grow up. Well, you seem pretty grown up to me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. I had a fight for that before they wouldn't give me any responsibility or support toward becoming a better person. And until I found NAMI and North Star, there was no hope or purpose in my life. So when I first got night notes, they said that I would be drinking coffee, smoking cigarettes, and that would be my life. And they said by the time I was 50, I'd be in a mental institution and never be able to get out. That's not very encouraging. No. (laughs) (laughs) So part of your journey sounds like it's been to prove the naysayers wrong. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with when we were in Minnesota, a lot of the naysayers were the doctors and the nurses, and they were teaching my parents that I would never amount to anything. How did you find out about North Star? Well, my therapist was trying to get me into an adult daycare program. So she thought North Star was an adult daycare. It's not. And when she found out it was an employment-based program, she kind of backpedaled and said, I guess you are ready for work. And stopped treating me like a little kid, putting me in adult daycare, and actually gave me the ability to do what I want to do. So aside from being a peer support specialist, how else do you help around the clubhouse? I'm usually doing paperwork, operations and operations management, also grant research and writing. I'm in the process of writing a grant right now, which would help in training, comprehensive training. I also am managing the files right now at North Star. So those files are basically member files, and we're going through and finding ones that don't have referrals or paperwork that's missing and insurance information, and we're trying to get it into the computer. Have attitudes and treatment options expanded since you first became diagnosed? I mean, is the landscape still the same? I was diagnosed, but I wasn't told what it was. It was all hidden from me, and I never took medication, never went back. 2004. But in 2004, there was very limited amount of treatment that you could do for schizophrenia as far as antipsychotics go. But so far, they've expanded the world of antipsychotics, but they're not very efficient. Right now, there's no cure for schizophrenia. You will always hear voices. You will always hear noises. You will always be paranoid. You will always be delusional. Something I had to come to terms with a long time ago is quality over quantity. I want quality of life, 
not quantity of life. What that means is some of the medications they give you destroy your organs and your body and other various items in your system, but they make your mind clear. And I say, okay, I want my mind to be clear. I want to know what I'm thinking before I die. I'd prefer to be in my right mind. But that means I won't live as long. And that's the treatment options that we have right now for schizophrenia. It's a death sentence. Whether you have the 10% that kill themselves in the first 25 years, another 10 in the next 25 years which is a very high percentage. I think that it's not a matter of killing themselves, I think it's more of a matter of mistakenly hurting themselves. But that's our treatment options for right now, and it's it's very bleak. You really dodged a bullet there. Oh, yeah. And I wasn't speaking in English, so it didn't help the nurses and doctors. Where do you find fellowship and support in your life? You know, I find fellowship with other members that are mentally ill. And I say that because mentally ill is not just a diagnosis, but a enlightenment to what true friendship really is. And I mean that by the fact that my first real friend was Bipolar 1. She is in Minnesota. I met her at a crisis unit. And I didn't understand what real friendship was until I met her. She's still my best friend. We talk every day. And without her and her support, I wouldn't have made it. So that was your first experience with basically peer-delivered services and peer support. Yeah. And my husband, my ex-husband, he was schizophrenic. He fell into the trap of alcohol and drugs, so I lost him to St. Peter Mental Institution for the Criminally Ill. And as far as I know, he had a lobotomy done. He was so violent. He never was violent toward me. He'd yell, but who doesn't? It wasn't that I knew he was falling into something. I didn't know what, and I knew I couldn't pull him out anymore. So I had to leave. But that was the one instance where I wish I could have done more. And I know that with my friend Naomi, the one that is peer support for me, I try to give peer support to other members of North Star, to members of NAMI, to give them guidance and to show them that even me, somebody who they said would never amount to anything, amounted to something. Did you get your peer support specialist training through NAMI? Yeah. Did anything in particular inspire you to become a peer support specialist, or is it related to your early experiences, just having peers who understand? Actually, I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up, which I never grew up, so I'm not a doctor, but actually a psychiatrist. Because I cannot go to school for that, because I wouldn't be accepted in the world of psychiatry, I decided to go for something I would be accepted for that still deals with people in the peer setting. Now you've talked about some of the things that schizophrenia deprives you of in life, Mm -hmm. but are there ways in which it serves you? Make me think, why don't you? Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) that's my goal. The way it served me was it made me get true friendship, true camaraderie, and find true love. People will take advantage of that, but for the most part, I've been very lucky in that area. I think it brings to the table compassion. When you have schizophrenia and you see somebody else with it, and you see them struggling, talking to the voices, acting out, it brings you compassion and learn how to talk to that person rather than talk at them. It gives you the strength to help another human being. It's hard to be schizophrenic, but it would be even harder if I didn't have any way of bringing that to the table. And being someone with schizophrenia, it is a horrible disease. I'm not going to make sh- make it sound enlightenment or anything, but it also isolates you from the bad things going on in the world. What I mean by that is I don't pay attention to a lot of the crap that people pull. I pay attention to the good. 
I see the good in people. And I think that's what it really brought to the table for me. What kind of goals are you able to set for yourself now that you no longer feel like you're being infantilized by the system? I did my resume. So one of my goals is to get part-time employment as a peer support specialist. Also, I feel that I have more control over my treatment because I'm no longer taking a back seat and saying, oh, okay, just do whatever. I'm actually saying, no, I don't want that. Or yes, I do want that. Not saying, oh, okay, I have more say. And I had to realize that I need to set boundaries. So that's actually one of my goals as well, It's to set boundaries. So that way I don't get taken advantage of or infantilized by the system. What's your favorite part of North Star? My favorite part is the work. Believe it or not, I love doing work because I feel like there's a purpose. It's so much fun. I get to type and think out of the box. And sometimes it's tedious and it's like, oh, this is a nightmare. But most of the time I get to think out of the box and I get to use my brain and skills that I have obtained over the years. Is there anything else you'd like to express about schizophrenia? I have a brain do do do. <laughs> <laughs> I think that intelligence is really underlooked as far as people with schizophrenia. They think we're idiots. I met some of the smartest people in my life that had mental illness, whether it be schizophrenia or bipolar, severe mental illness. We do have brains, and I just want people to know that I can think just like anyone else. I can feel just like anyone else. So give me a chance. Any last words? Just that North Star has really given me purpose, and I really appreciate it. We are glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Lynette. Thank you. If you like this video and want to support North Star, please go to northstarclubhouse.org and click Donate.